right after we announced that we were doing our very first festival in November 2001, when I got back to my office, I got the first call I received was from Doran Weber, and he said, I want to support you, I'd like to sponsor the film festival, and I just said, can I take your number and I'll call you back. Um, I didn't know um, that I, we'd all be sitting here, standing here, um, 17 years later. So to Doran and the Sloan Foundation, a heartfelt thanks from all of us at Tribeca because you have uh, been vital to the entire Tribeca uh, organization since our first festival. Together with the Tribeca Film Institute, uh, the Sloan Filmmaker, uh, Foundation, Sloan Filmmaker Fund has awarded more than $1.75 million to storytellers who integrate science and technology into the art. Now, why this is Tribeca born is that a few years ago, producer Emily Mortimer uh, discovered this project while she was on the Sloan student jury for TFI. Emily got so excited, she kept talking about it and thinking about it, and then she and her co-producer, Alessandro Nivolo, uh, connected, and they then went and met with director Sean Schneider, and together it's the result of this wonderful dark buddy comedy that you're going to see tonight. I'd like to introduce Sean Schneider. Hello. I'm winging it up here, and I'm really anxious for you to watch the movie, so I'll keep it short. I just want to say thank you to the Albert P. Sloan Foundation and the Tribeca Film Institute and the festival for believing in this very strange and, and intensely personal uh, product from, from day one, from the pitch on the page. Um, and this has just all been uh, a dream to, to be here, to have a first feature with, with this level of, of loving support and this caliber of collaborators just across the cast and crew. So I, I just want to say thank you to my producers who made manifest this, this dream and uh, our cast and, and our crew, um, friends and family, many who came in from, from a very uh, far away. Um, my partner in uh, art and, and daydreaming, Jason Begay. My partner in life and love and parenting, Michelle Parallella. Our daughter, Ainsley, who just left with the babysitter. And, um, and, and to, my mom, uh, to my mom, who this is for, uh, my dad and my sister, who, who are here as well. We'll talk more after the movie. Thank you so much. of artist programs at the Tribeca Film Institute and we could not be more proud to be a very tiny part of this amazing journey. Um, before I introduce our incredible partner from the Sloan Foundation, I just want to remind you all once again that this film is eligible for the Audience Award, so please download the app and vote. Still in the theater, if you have any trouble with that, there's people out in the lobby to help you out. Um, and without further ado, I would like to invite our incredible partner from the Sloan Foundation, Doran Weber. Amazing. Uh, congratulations to Sean again. Um, so Jane Rosenthal was reminding me, you know, that column made during November 2011, uh, 2001. For those of you who weren't here, uh, this festival was created actually in response to uh, death and destruction, the theme of this film, on a, of course, on a massive, unprecedented scale. And this was a, a response, a creation, a, a beautiful creation now in the 17th year. And I think in some strange way, and we'll see how much Sean wants to tell us about what this is about one human's response to another human's death, but the theme is uh, recurrent. So about just briefly about the Sloan Foundation, we're nonprofit philanthropy. It's important to remind people nonprofit because some foundations um, these days take money. We don't take money, we give money. We make grants for research and education and science, technology, and economics. Uh, this film won two awards from us, and I want you to know how good we are at picking winners. One of our signature programs is called the Sloan Research Fellowships. We give them to scientists early in their careers. 48 of those people that have won our fellowships have gone on to win the Nobel Prize, so that's a pretty good batting average. <clears throat> We're going to look for Sean to get more uh, 
uh, to win more prizes. Um, this is part of our uh, public understanding of science effort. We're kind of like a non-profit multimedia company for science. We support books, radio, films, theater, television, new media, all to encourage leading artists to create more realistic and compelling stories about science technology and to challenge the stereotypes of scientists and engineers in the public imagination. We support six leading film schools. One of them is NYU Tisch, which is where Sean's script first came before us, and it um, won a $100,000 first feature award at NYU. And then what we do is we have a best of the best competition, which is run by the Tribeca Film Institute, our wonderful partners. And that was the second award it won, and that's when Emily Mortimer, I still remember the expression on your face, Emily, when um, saw the, read the script and was blown away by it. And I must say also, I read hundreds of scripts a year, probably thousands over the years, and there's some where they just pop uh, off the page, and this was one of them. So um, without further ado, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Jen Schwartz, who is the senior editor of Scientific American, who covers the intersection of science and society, and you are going to hear from seven people who had a critical role in bringing this before you. So please welcome Jen Schwartz. So first person, director, Sean Snyder. And uh, producer, Emily Mortimer. Another producer, Alessandro Nivola. <laughs> Actor, Matthew Broderick. <laughs> Actor, Geza Rohig. <laughs> producer, Ron Perlman. So thanks everyone for being here. Um, I actually wanted to start with you, Emily, because uh, you saw this from the very beginning. And uh, I think what we've just seen is a film that has, it's about science, obviously, but it's really about so much more than that. And I'm curious, when you were judging uh, this grant initially, uh, and you had all these scripts that were science-themed. What was it about Sean's that stood out to you? Um, I think it was, it was well, first of all, it was just a beautiful script, and, and, and um, like Doran, we all read so many and scripts uh, for our job, and, and uh, both as actors and, and now producers, and, and they're normally really, really bad. <laughs> and, um, and then when you read one that's really, really good, it's just immediately you know it. And, and so I think that was the first thing. I just read the script and I was just completely gripped. And, and Sandro, um, who I'm married to, is my fellow producer, one of my fellow producers, um, describes uh, listening to me in bed uh, as I was reading these scripts one night, trying to get them finished in order for the, to do the deliberation. And Well, you can tell them the, the, how you could tell. But I, no, I not just that. They kept, I kept hearing them slam against the floor only seconds after she'd opened the cover. <laughs> One night, um, I remember just hearing pages turning, <laughs> and then she finished it and handed it to me and said, I think that this, yeah. this is something you should and it, and it was really just, I think, because it, in, a, in a way, it was, it was that he'd so integrated science the, you know, the task was to, to, to write a screenplay that, that uses science, and and um, Sean's was the only one that really integrated the science of the story into the storytelling in a way that really felt like important and interesting and, and made me think more about how science is really part of all of our lives in a way that we don't kind of register most of the time. And, and what I loved was that it's a film Primarily, I think it's a film about love. It's about different kinds of love. It's about uh, the grief you feel when someone that you love madly dies, and and then about how um, friendship, the love of another man or friend, can can help you through somehow. 
um, the loneliness and, and, and pain of, of being on your own in, in, in that moment of loss. But then, then also threading through it is this strange conceit, which is what's happening to this, this man's wife un, un, under the ground as she's decomposing, what's happening to her body and his obsession with finding out the answer to it. And of course it's a red herring in the end, but, it, but Schmuel feels like if only he can know, if only he can know the different phases of, his, of the decomposing body, he'll be able to get some kind of peace. And, um, and uh, I, I, I just felt, um, uh, I, I guess it was just, yes, it was all those things. It was, it was all those things that struck me as, as beautiful and strange and odd and like we had to make the movie. So science, with a capital S, can often feel so isolated from our everyday lives and other. And when you set out to make this, you weren't doing a forensic anthropology film, <laughs> of course. So I'm curious, Sean, what were the seeds of the idea for this? And then how did your own sort of scientific inquiry, as you were looking into the science side of things, start to inform the script itself? So the earliest seeds, um, I lost my own mom nine years ago. And I come from a Reformed Jewish background, which is certainly not Hasidic, and, and, but yet there is a, a way that you mourn, and there's a ritual, and there's timeline. And it's beautiful, and it's poetic, and it's psychologically profound, and yet my grief spilled outside the bounds of it. And it's nine years later, and I still grieve, and I'm grateful for my grief, and I'm grateful for the ways in which my grief continues to evolve. Um, and I've also, I've never felt uh, comfort at my, at my mom's grave. I've only felt the, the you know, sense that her remains are, are this, this biological, <laughs> biological thing that was her is six feet below. And so Judaism gives you this, this timeline for mourning, and it, it, you do this for seven days, and then you do this for a month, and then you do this for a year. And it's this timeline in which these, these thoughts about, you know, well, what is happening to my mom after seven days, uh, what's happening to my mom after 30 days, what's happening to my mom after a year, and they're these, they're, they're uh, morbid questions, and I think they're very human questions, and I think that we have, all have these questions, but, but we're, we're told to poeticize them, and, and all of the funeral practices are, are intended to forestall this biological reality. And, uh, and I think we repress those thoughts when we have them. And, and essentially, if one were, and I didn't go crazy with it, but if one, if one were to pursue those questions, they would essentially be scientific in nature. Um, and I'm the least likely person to write a film about, about science. But asking this question and pursuing that research set me on this strange journey. I assumed that, that um, I would Google it and there would be an answer and there would be no film. There would be no story there, there would be no drama. But I went down this rabbit hole that involved pigs, which how could I not? And body farms, which how does that exist? We'll learn later on down the line. Um, and, and an infinite number of factors at play in how any single body might decompose. And that maddening search, uh, mirrored the process that Shmuel goes through, and it's ultimately a humility before that, that science and before that infinite number of factors, as I believe there should be a humility before our God and as, as aligned with the infinite number of ways in which we grieve. Mm -hmm. And I think what's really interesting about this film is that it doesn't pit science against religion. It actually shows how similar they can be in the quest for answers. Um, and so I wanted to ask Donnie, um, you know, Science it doesn't have all the answers, but someone, sometimes people think it does, that there are easy, clean, definitive answers. And in your work, um, and, and Donnie leads a, a body farm, um, so she is actually the head of uh, the first and largest um, you know, research center in the country. And so that is all based on <laughs> very real stuff. The whole um, panel is looking at you like, oh, and she looks so normal. <laughs> <laughs> Almost all of you. <laughs> so what, in, in your job, which is very based on forensics and providing answers, you know, she was, um, you know, identifying bodies after, um, after certain events or crimes, and she's done uh, work with genocide in Africa. But people come to you and, and they want quick, easy answers. What do you tell them about the field and about understanding how bodies decay that 
it, it's more complex than, than you think it is. Well, a lot of the misconceptions about forensic science in general, and certainly what we do at the University of Tennessee, comes from what you see on television. Um, and so the notion that we can solve all crimes in, in 25 to 45 minutes without per commercial breaks um, really makes it difficult sometimes to prepare families and prepare even law enforcement uh, for the realities that it might take a long time to come to an answer or we might not ever know the answer given what the question is. What we do at the Forensic Anthropology Center and one of our resources is the body farm in Knoxville is we study human decomposition to try to answer the questions that we get from law enforcement not only in the US but from around the world and that often involves who this person was, how did they die, but also how long ago they died. And so that can answer questions about who a missing individual might be, but also who might be involved in their demise. So, so evaluating suspect stories. And so we have the gift of people who donate their bodies to us for forensic science research. And we might not be able to tell in any particular forensic case that yes, it was this person died exactly seven days ago. The science isn't there for that. The, the differences that, um, that uh, Sean talked about through Matthew's character are real. There's so much variation in this. And our job is to understand that variation so that we can determine the limits of the science, so that we don't answer a question to a police officer inappropriately. Yes, it was exactly seven days ago, because that may lead them down the wrong path. Our job is to give an estimate based on the science which isn't necessarily a pinpoint answer. So there's also, uh, you know, I, I think Sean thought, oh, he found you and he thought, wonderful, we can just go down there, we can shoot, it'll be fine. Yes. Um, but, you know, <laughs> you know, you feel very strongly that, uh, you know, what the work that you do is, uh, that you honor it, and that this is something very, um, you know, again, people think, well, science, oh, well, they're just cadavers and they're studying them and it's a lab. But can you reframe it, and you know, I know you've experienced this with Donnie, of how you talk about how the value of having bodies to study? As you might imagine, we get a number of requests uh, to film at the facility, um, to come and do tours and things like that. And we don't allow that. Um, we do for some scientific um, programs like National Geographic and things like that. Um, but we hold um, the respect of the donors, we don't call them cadavers, we don't call them specimens, we call them donors, we call them individuals with the highest respect. And uh, we want to treat them with dignity and we, I think that that was captured in this, in this film, that they didn't let them in to the facility to see what was going on. And um, Sean and I talked, I think we spent at least a couple of days together and, and talked about things. Um, in a way that he could bring the film to life, but not in a way that um, disregarded the dignity of, of the donors that we have at the facility or what we do. Mm -hmm. So that is um, our primary concern is for science, but also to protect the anonymity and dignity of the donors who give the gift of body donation to us. So we became donors. Uh, I was a donor. I was a dead body. <laughs> in the, in the, we, we, we couldn't go down and, and, and actually film in, in, in Tennessee, and so we, we filmed in Sandro's grandparents' garden in, um, <laughs> in the woods in Long Island. And, and I'm the bat with the maggots. Cool, you know, some, some cameos. <laughs> and, and, and Sean's a cameo, but I'm not going to tell you which one. Um, <laughs> I, uh, go on, go I, th I think that um, one of the interesting things that I realized, and this is, this is about the, the dignity of the donors as well, that, and tell me if I'm incorrect, Donnie, but that there's very little research that's done on routine burials because that wouldn't serve saving lives or, or identifying and that that is an aspect of, of the research that's, that's sort of untapped, which, you know, not deal with decomposition to try to find justice to try to, uh, you know, for forensics, but not for our emotional understanding of how a body decomposes. So that kind of journey alongside the science and how much I thought was an interesting way of approaching it. 
We do have some burials at the facility for research purposes because uh, a lot of the work that I do is human rights work and that's all mass graves and burials. And we have other research that is, works with burials as well. So, but we have anywhere from 150 to 200 donors at the facility at any one time. Most of those are above the ground uh, decomposing and um, we do have some that are in burials for research. And so it wasn't just the science that was so honored in this film. I think it's really interesting that the religion was also so honored and uh, coming at these things with such clarity and the granular quality of how uh, you captured them was um, just, it made for a really strong film. So I actually, I don't know if any of you know this, but Geza um, actually works uh, and he prepares bodies for burial. Um, and he's, you've been doing it since 2001, and you're, you still, you, you did a few this week. And I think you mentioned to me that your boss is also here. <laughs> um, so you were obviously the, the perfect fit for this role. And I'm, I'm curious, for you, uh, you know, this, this, this film, it's, it's dark, oh, this is a heavy subject. But you're used to this being part of your day-to-day -day life and having a comfort with death. And I think your character showed that. I'm curious what you can tell us about what the Jewish tradition says about death and the afterlife, and how your experiences and the work that you've done informed your character. Um, Sean and I had a conversation at one point that uh, can, can this movie be done in any other communities? You know, does it have to be uh, Orthodox Jewish, or could it be Amish, or Catholic, or anything? And, and I think we came to the conclusion that it must be Jewish. And partly because I think there is this setup out there that somehow science and religion are somehow opposing forces. And the more science advances, somehow God has to retreat. You know, this, this, this image. And, and I think Judaism is very unique in this sense that uh, the more we know about the world scientifically, the deeper our wonder it going to be about the greatness of that. So Jews throughout history were never quartered or worried about science and research and discovery. And I think that's pretty clear in the attitude of Shmuel as well. That you know he's really interested. He's coming from a very he's from a very tight community and he's so undereducated in the New York standards or secular standards. But he, he has no any sort of prejudice negative attitude towards Science and he knows, make no mistake, he has no some sort of a you know huge illusion about science because the reason why science and religion I, don't, I think don't compete over territory is because they answer to different questions. Religion is basically about who done it, why done it, and science is all about how was it done. Or somewhat, some uh, person said it even better. He said. Science takes things apart, and the religion puts things to seeing how they work. It takes things apart, and religion puts things together to see what they mean. So I think they they not just coexist, but side by side. But in this religion, at all, at, at least, they need they they almost assume or suppose each other, and, and there's nothing wrong in rabbinical tradition to to do your utmost. You know, to to uh, to understand the world. It's a path to God, to to scientific the, the, the methods of science and the work uh, you know, work that science provides us. But you you play the character. He's very matter of fact, but he's also deeply curious, which of course is a you know that's like baseline scientific thinking is asking questions and oh this is how it's done. Well, we will do it by this method, and I think. That's why it's so interesting that scene in the classroom where they're doing the pH soil test. And he says, but the book said it would be this way because the textbook said this. And he thought, it'll literally happen. It'll provide the answer. Um, and that's, he's so disappointed <laughs> when it's not the case. Is that, did you play him? You know, he, yes, he's not educated in the secular way, but he has that deep curiosity. Is that part of it? That's part of it, and there is, of course, just like Sean and I guess all of us up here, I have, you know, there's a personal component to it, and what I was really interested about is, um, this is a very patriarchic society, Hasidic communities, and so when, God forbid, a, a mother, a wife dies, it's, it's such an early stage, 
that's like a, a queenless hive, you know, and and everything falls into chaos. This this there's no there's very hard for a, for an orthodox Hasidic man to run a family by himself. And I think what captured me even on the script level, and, and, and Sean and I met three years ago, so we, we really, I, I was lucky enough to, to be part of this quite early on, is, is exactly understand, it's quite enigmatic figure, Shmuel, you know, like, is he a dummy? Sometimes he looks like comically dummy, like, really like a sympathy. And, but but I, I also hope to, to play him in a way that there is some, some depth, He's not a man of words, clearly. English is not even his first language. So that womanless family and that madness immediately after the, the loss of a loved one, that which Sean said it, you know, you should, there is a choreography, right? You should let it go, 730 and a year. But of course, we are human, and we don't behave like molecules, and so the way Shmuel carries this, is like the Rebbe says a good line, he says, you mourn him like you mourn a parent. But there are reasons why people do that, and most likely, I'm just guessing, is because if you had no parent, or you didn't have the parent you needed, then your wife or spouse will end up like a parent in some ways, and this is so human. Um, Matthew, I'm wondering, for your character, uh, I think, I'm curious about what you saw as his motivation to keep going along with this endeavor. Um, <laughs> he keeps saying no and then kind of immediately says yes. But there are those moments when he lights up, when he's sort of rediscovering the joy of the scientific method and saying, this is a good way to do it, or this is a you know horrible way, in a, you know, disrespectful of science. Do you, yeah. Was that how you were, how were you thinking about his motivation to stay in this? Just like that. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think, well, he doesn't have a whole lot going on at community college, it appears. Um, but I, I figure somewhere in him he liked science way back. And um, this is a chance to get back onto the field, you know, for him. Uh, you know, but more there's the human event of a man coming in great pain, and eventually it's also that. They both have their own pain, I suppose. Um, but the science part of it, I think, if you've been teaching students who don't seem terribly interested, at least in the little we see of it, uh, it must be sort of exciting to have somebody with a real problem that you might be able to research and look into and and help, and, and that's what he loves doing, I suppose. So, so there's both that and also just the guy just needs him, so he wants to help him, even though he's a, some, might be a selfish person, he's still human. And um, yeah, that's about all. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious how many pork jokes ended up on the cutting room floor. Pork jokes. That was a real pig. The pig was very uncooperative. <laughs> I, noticed, I noticed that the pig was given milk. Was that intentional? <laughs> there, were, there were all kinds of things and they got yes. pinned out. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to know what was on that floor. Oh, it's disgusting. It wasn't just milk. Vaulting. <laughs> so, you know, for everyone who was putting this together, um, you know, on paper this looks like a sort of quiet and, um, and, and small film and, and very about the human emotions and about the scientific exploration, but logistically there are pigs, there are dead bodies, there are, you know, uh, what, what were some of the challenges in, in filming this, in, again, in just the pigs, the bodies, the sensitivities, the really getting it right? Are you talking to me? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, before, uh, this is a good time to mention that there are two other wonderful producers who worked on this, uh, on this with us, Scott Lagmus and Josh Crook, who are here. And uh, we were told that, that they weren't as attractive as Ron and, and me and Emily, so they, they weren't welcome. <laughs> and there just too, there's just too many of us, and there's not enough room on the stage, but um, they were invaluable. Um, uh, yeah, no, this was uh, a movie that um, 
we knew was ambitious from the start and yet uh, was always going to be uh, tricky to raise money for because uh, it's totally original. And those are always the movies that are hardest to make and are most uh, gratis gratifying once they're made. Um, you know, as far as the things that the challenges, I mean, you, you summed it up. I mean, I think I remember our first meeting where we sat around a, a conference table talking about how much money we needed to make the movie. And we were talking about making it under a million, which we did. And uh, the first question was, you know, where are we going to get a pig? And, uh, and, um, Where did that pig come from? <laughs> there was a, a, a kid from a farm. <laughs> it probably it's looked a lot like a wonder. It ended up as a wonder. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, One of the, the major challenges. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them about the challenge of the demented park ranger who decided to throw a chair oh, yeah. at Matthew's Matthew head. Matthew was nearly decapitated. Uh, at a park in uh, Staten twice. Island one night. Yeah, go with my laser tried to kill me. Or you got to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so that was true too. Oh, yeah. when? What are you talking about? Um, no, when we were we were at that lake and uh, there was this uh, slightly unhinged park ranger oh. there who had allowed us to, to film. The, the night prior, I mean, there was uh, to be docile <laughs> for for the first night, but by the second night, he wasn't having it and. Uh, we found ourselves all, um, well, we'd all moved on to a new location, and Matthew was Matthew just, having was just a nap, trying to I think. change. You know, yes. he, was, he was half naked. I, I was sitting in a chair in a little <laughs> wooden room. In a cupboard, in a tiny cupboard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard an incredible <laughs> screaming, I don't know if this is scientific, but it's <laughs> a screaming argument out, because I guess we had stayed too long at that location or something. We've done very little wrong. Okay, um, the park ranger was very, very upset and I screaming and throwing furniture. And I heard a PA say, I've just got to get my people out. And I was meanwhile behind this little thin door hearing it. And then uh, I peeked out and I saw the ranger, and I said, I'm leaving, you know, here I come. And uh, he was like, all right. And I said, I, and I realized my clothes were still in, I was in a costume, and my clothes were still in. So I said, I have to get my clothes. And he was like, okay. So it's not, the story doesn't have a great ending. I got my clothes. We went to the out in the parking lot. But he Emily the came police. and sweet talked. I mean, she was the only you person he would speak to. I fixed it, but we we got halfway home. It was about two o'clock in the morning, and then we got a call saying the police are being called. He's gonna get back. Here. I think he was in a very frightening way, really attracted to you. And that. I, was, I was quite attracted to him in a frightening way. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't have many teeth. So there was, there was uh, the the, da the the danger of Ranger Rick running off with my wife. That was one. The the other time was it was could only happen in Staten Island. We shot the whole film on Staten Island. It seemed like an appropriate segue. <laughs> we, had to put the, we had to put the DP up in my mom's uh, apartment. Another challenge was my preternatural fear of heights, and I had to drive every morning. Once he he got a job where he went to Africa, so just towards the end of the movie, and I had to drive the cinematographer and the operator and Sean and Jason, the writer, over the Verrazano Bridge every day and back again. And I was just terrified. I'm terrified of bridges and driving. <laughs> I would just go, I would close my eyes and hope for the best. And these people just couldn't believe their luck when they got to work alive. That was the, that was the first challenge every day, getting over the Verrazano Bridge. You were, Why? It was all, we had existential fear that we put into the film. <laughs> <laughs> Why Staten Island? Um, the realities of making making a movie. I think that you 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 make a movie at this budget level in a house with two characters, and we somehow pulled it off with all of these locations, animals, amazing uh, kids. You're told never, you know, no animals, no kids. Um, uh, amazing wardrobe, amazing production design, amazing amazing value. A rain machine in a cemetery. And I, the, the love and the miracles that went into making this uh, is just so humbling and, and amazing to me. And it's, it's because and can I, I May I say, Sean, a lot of the way of getting 
the beautiful work out of everybody, if, if honestly, is because they all, they really like you. And the <laughs> wanted them to somehow make it to the end. <laughs> Everybody really wanted to help you. That's how you are. It was great working for you. That's, that's why I just want to make sure I say that. I think you did a beautiful job. Thank you. <laughs> I'm curious if, to Ron or you know, any, of the, any of you actually who were you know, attracted to coming and being part of this film. Um, a bunch of you have said it kind of crosses genres and it, it brings a lot of them together. Um, and I, you know, it's a film about science that really is so much more than that. Um, what about this really speaks to like the universal, universal quality that it's resonant with anyone? Um, that this is not, you know, uh, this is not about, you know, a profile of Albert Einstein. It, it's science woven in. I mean, is there something about the way that this was put together organically between the science and the emotionality that really worked, and that you thought, you know, that you were so drawn to as a project? Any, anyone can answer this? Oh, I mean, there's a, a beautiful kind of a theatricality when neither one of them fully does the trick. You know, when this guy has all of the tenets of religion at his disposal, this guy has all the tenets of science at his disposal, but it still needs to be this very, very feelingful, um, mysterious, because nobody as everybody is flailing around to figure out how to give this guy some relief, at the end of the day, it, it, it happens in an incredibly subtle, gradual, untheatrical way. And therein lies the, the beautiful theatrics of it all, is that you know, neither science nor religion are mutually exclusive, nor do they individually answer the question. It's some sort of an intersection of a journey that leads somebody to ultimately go, there was meaning there. And, you know, and everybody's trying to express it in, in a way that relates back to wh what their expertise is. But to me, the beauty of it was the ambiguity of it all, was the fact that it was neither, it was none of those things definitively. It was just a journey of two guys who were both at a loss. I mean, you know, he's, he's, he, he just throws away these things, these beautifully thrown away moments where he says, you know, I, I'm divorced and I have this weird thing, but I'm young, you know, I'm, well, you're what? You know, I'm limping through life here as he is. And, and somehow there's a comfort that they find to both of them, which is beautiful and, you, and tr truly original. That's why we got involved is because you read the script and you have no idea what's, where he's going. You have no idea where he's going. And, and, and that's the beauty of it, is the, is, is the ambiguity of it all. And the, it, it, ultimately, it's all about the heart, the human heart. Um, I just want to point out Jason Begay, my co-writer, my Goy co-writer. <laughs> And we, we always knew that it was universal, and despite the odd specificity, we were checking in on, you know, Jason was also that this is too, this, you know, you need to explain this, you don't need to explain this, we, the religion is, is the setting and, and, and it's woven into to it, but the, the universality, and that came between us and between the emotionality of it, is, is that we all grieve and that we all suffer loss and we all have to find our own place in this cycle. That demands that we move on and keep and keep going on, and I think that that that's why it's relatable. These questions that we ask and the the pain that we feel and the right to grieve and piece our lives back together in our own way is ultimately universal. Yeah, and the and the search for you know when something bad happens, the, the desperate search for meaning for understanding that you, there must be an answer, there must be a reason, I must be able to get to the bottom of this somehow. And, and ultimately, it, the, the, the really, there is no answer or meaning. Or it's just part of life, and loss is part of all of our lives. And it's just, you know, and, and that's how brilliant, why the science is so brilliant. It's like, 
this guy thinks that he can use science to give him a meaning and to, and to answer these unanswerable questions. And by the end, the only answer really is sort of love and finding a little fellow traveler to kind of get through it all with. Mm -hmm. um, and that feels very universal and lovely. <laughs> <laughs> And um, with that, let's open up questions to the audience. Back there in the blue shirt. I'm sorry. You can give her the blue shirt. You know, it's a uh, revelation to me. And we, you know, Ms. Mortimer talked about um, the love and the, and the joining together of science with religion. And, and going on this journey together. But the revelation to me, I grew up with the Christian faith, and when we bury people, we, we say ashes to ashes and dust to dust. But the revelation to me is the Jews put three holes at the bottom of the, of the box. So they are really acknowledging that we, we must go back to the earth, one way or the other. And, uh, and I, I never realized that before. I, I've always thought that the, the, the Jews were more conservative about this thing, but they actually confront it as the lead character wants to do. And I, wanted, I want to thank you for that, because that was a lesson. And I appreciate it. Thank you. This is a question for Sean Snyder, and also congratulations to everyone for what I thought was a remarkable film. Because Giza Rorig was so memorable and soulful in Son of Saul, where his character was obsessed with the right of burial, of taking a Jewish boy in Auschwitz and making sure that somehow the inhumanity was transcended, was part of your reason for casting him the film Son of Saul, or did you conceive of this prior to seeing Laszlo Nemesis' film? It was, it was conceived prior, and um, we had a mutual friend. I got to see Son of Saul post Can and, and, and before uh, its release. And I think that I'm the only person in the world that was watching Son of Saul trying to see if Geza could be funny. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say that, that the way he moves through that world in that movie, it's, it's very Chaplin-esque. Mm -hmm. And the, the narrow-minded mission that he's on, and as he skirts death left and right and, and, and moves through that camp, there's a, a, a physicality that he also brought to this role. I also knew he could dig and, and carry corpses. <laughs> um, but it was, it was, there's no other person who could have possibly played this role, and, and our mutual friend said, you guys have to meet. And I mean, it, it was, I was very, uh, I was very worried, because obviously our script dabbles in, in, in blasphemy, but never intends to lampoon. And Geza uh, is modern orthodox, and so I gave him the script to read, and we met, we had a lovely chat, and I was just terrified that, that the response, you know, would it be offended and, and we'd never talk again. And the uh, kindred spirituality that we, that we found um, was really beautiful. And, and just, I didn't know that, that Geza um, worked for a Hevra Kadisha, which is uh, prepared bodies for burial, until I read it in a New Yorker article five months after we met, which also speaks to, to Geza's humility. Um, and that, you know, it was, um uh, Dylan Liner uh, from Sony Classics, who may still be here tonight. He, he was here, unless he walked out halfway through. Um, but he, it, it was all of our mutual friends, and, and he told us uh, the minute he read the script that there was no one else who could play it, and they had released Son of Saul, and so he arranged the introduction uh, originally. So that was a, a great stroke of luck, and we owe him a lot of gratitude because he really godfathered this, this project from its inception. Mike. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit more about uh, the role of the story of the Dybbuk in writing the script? How did, you, how did that structure and that story inform each other? 
Um, that was also an amazing discovery. It's like as, as you write and as you're on to something, um, you start with a story and you start with the emotionality and the, the themes and the details just come to you. I, I, um, I spent time hanging out uh, in the, the Hasidic community. There, there's essentially what I call like Hasidic speakeasies, um, where folks who have left the community and folks who are in the community, one foot in, one foot out, kind of ga gather on weeknights and revelry until five in the morning, and I, and I met folks there, and that was the first mention of, of the Dybbuk, and Isaac Bashev is singer, um, and the film The Dybbuk, and speaking with, with um, uh, Hasidic members of, of the community, so that was the first movie that they watched. It was a horror film for them when they were a child. They somehow got their, their hands on it. And then you go and you, you find, you know, that you think a Dybbuk is a, is a ghost and there's different ways that it might manifest, you know, e with evil or with, with love. But the idea of the, the Dybbuk is this, just somebody who doesn't ha who hasn't completed their time on earth has things that they're longed to. The, the poet, the poetry of the Dybbuk and the metaphor for what Shmuel was going through. The funny thing that I think about is that his sons, latch on to this outlandish folklore and that they have the best understanding of what their father is actually going through. Um, and it just worked perfectly and to be able to stumble across. I also found um, the, the, fil the film, it, and as I watched it for the first time, and if you've never seen it, you could get it on YouTube. It's a 1937 Yiddish film. Um, it, it's like German Expressionism and, and, and B-horror. Um, prior to, you know, Val Luton and B-Horror in the United States, it has that look and that feel to it, and it's all in Yiddish, and it's this poetic, beautiful horror story about love and, and loss and, and ghosts. <laughs> um, it just fit perfectly in. There was no, no other way than not to use it. <coughs> we actually to uh, humanize a little bit of this uh, Vedic element. Because there is this folk theory, and it's sort of scary, it's like vampire stuff, it's weird being possessed and having two souls in you. But if you look at it in a more practical way, I think it's an enormous comfort, at least I found comfort, and I went through loss, that somehow the person who you truly love and you lose, somehow that person turns up inside of you and you take on the best characteristics of that person. So you are, it's somehow you lost him or her, but that person inhabits you. And you are not just a divot. That should be a nicer, more positive <laughs> twist, twist to it. You, yeah. you really carry those people on in you in the most warm, loving way. And that's a very, that's a consolation to me. And, the, and it was so perfect going alongside this film that like, and this whole film is about that. What starts out as, as seemingly outlandish becomes poetic and human and, and ultimately beautiful. And, and On the way here, that's what exactly I thought, is that um, they, they say life is plural. And in Hebrew, and that's the last verb of the movie, Lachayim, right? So in Hebrew, the noun for life is only exists in plural. Chaim is in plural. And the word in Hebrew for man, Adam, only exists in singular. There's no such thing as Adami. And that somehow beautifully uh, expresses the human condition. That you can't live by yourself, and yet we are destined at some points, we can't be always with others. And that's exactly the stress in this, in this line that he, in this movie, that he lost his wife. He clearly lost so romantically her. It's very clear, even though it must have been an arranged marriage and all that, they were really very together. And, and that a new relationship enters, just like M said, a new relationship. And other, again, life is cruel. There is something, not everything is lost. And he is this guy who is somehow, I feel he's stopped. I think he's right in the depth of melancho melancholy. Mm -hmm. Am I saying it right? Melancholy. Yeah. melancholy. Yeah, and I think I mourn. And I remember Freud saying that the difference between a mourner and someone who's in melancholy is that for the mourner, the world, the entire world became rigid and dark and cold, while the melancholist 
God the world became rigid and dark and cold, but his people, he himself became rigid. So I think we really help each other out in yeah. this movie, because yeah. I have a different issue than you, 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 you have. You, you seem to be composed in, on the surface level in society or <laughs> community, community college professor, right? But really, you are a pot smoker, crazy. <laughs> yeah. Right? So me, I think, on the other hand, on the surface, unlike you, I'm all a mess. I mean, I'm a mess. I'm just gazing, like, really clearly, like, not even being here at time. But I think in the center of my being, there might be more harmony and order than in yours. And that is the, exactly the, the interesting dialectics of our friendship. So on that lovely note, um, that's all we have time for, but thank you to all of you and to all of you.